Hi, this is Irv Shapiro with Make With Tech. And I have made a video for a couple weeks now, maybe going on close to three weeks, but I have a good excuse. I've been working on a very, very special project. I've been hunkered down in the Make With Tech lab, coding, programming a new application for the 3D printing community. And I'm going to announce this new application in the next week or so right here on this channel. So if you want to hear that announcement, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you're notified when that new video comes out. Now today, I'm going to do something very interesting. I've looked over the last three years or so of videos and thousands and thousands of comments and questions, and there are a series of questions of things that people ask over and over again. And some of them relate to specific printers, some of them relate to specific techniques, but a lot of them relate to Cura. So today, we're going to look at the Cura Slicer, and I'm gonna share with you six key secrets. These are secrets right out in the open. Anyone could discover these, but they've been helpful to people over the years, and some of them are completely different now with the latest version of Cura. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Now, before we dive into specific features about Cura, there's a general concept that we have to get straight. Some people think that when they buy a new 3D printer, the profile that you get with a slicer is very, very specific to that printer. That it will only work with that printer. That there's something magical connecting it between the slicer and the printer. And that if you want to use Cura or Prusa Slicer, or any other of your favorite tools for producing G-code for your printer, you have to use one specifically built for your printer. That's not accurate. The majority of consumer grade, home-based or small business 3D printers, specifically I'm talking here about filament-based printers, all operate by interpreting a language, a protocol called G-code. G-code are just commands, we're gonna look at a couple of them in a moment, that you send to your printer or that your printer reads off an SD card or a USB key that tell it what to do, what temperature it should be at, where to draw a line of filament, what layer it should be at. That G-code is pretty much universal. Yes, it might be interpreted slightly differently by different printers, but it's generally universal. As important, the majority of 3D printers that sell for under $1,000 and many that sell for more use a version of firmware. Firmware being software that runs inside a machine. There's firmware in your refrigerator. There's firmware in your watch if you have an electronic watch. There's Firmware in your television, if you have a smart television. It's the software inside a machine. The firmware in many 3D printers is based upon a very popular open source project called Marlin. And this Marlin software, because it's open source, is basically the same from one printer to the next. They might make some tweaks here and there. If they're doing it properly, they release their changes to the community so other people can see them. Their displays might be different. The parameters that drive their stepper motors that move the components might be different. But generally, they're all using G-code interpreted by Marlin. What does that mean? It means that if I have a brand new printer. So I recently reviewed the Mingda Magician X. Runs on Marlin. And I could use a specialized profile for that printer running in Cura, 
But you know what? If I took and I sliced a print, if I converted a 3D object to G-code using a slicer with Cura set up for a Creality Ender 3, my guess is it would probably print just fine. Now with that in mind, let's open up Cura and show you how you select a printer definition for your printer if it's not listed there. Right now, I'm using Cura running on a Mac. We're going to switch to a Windows-based machine, a Surface Go, a small laptop, at the very end of this video, because one particular feature I want to demonstrate has bugs on the Mac but works fine on Windows. In general, it, if you're using Cura, it doesn't matter what kind of machine you're using it on. It's going to function basically the same. So I'm going to go here to the About box to show you that I'm running in Cura 4.13.1. That's the very latest release as of this video. If you're using Cura 4. something, most of what I'm going to show you is going to be exactly the same. I generally have found that Cura is very stable and I upgrade almost immediately when a new release is available. So I want to add a new printer. Well, you can see the Magician X is already added. I did this recently, but let's add a brand new one. So I'm going to go to this little arrow here, this little pointer here, and I'm going to select Add Printer. I'm going to select a non-network printer because basically the only network printers that Cura supports are from Ultimaker. Ultimaker is the sponsor of this open source project. So we're going to go down here and scroll down and wow, the printer I'm looking for is not listed. It's the Make With Tech New Printer. So what do I do? Well, I'm going to look at my printer. And the configuration is very similar to an Ender 3. It has a print bed that moves back and forth. It has a square gantry over the printer. It looks very similar. Well, guess what? If your printer looks like, is about the same size, runs the same firmware Marlin as another printer, start with that printer's profile and just modify it. So we're going to go down here to Creality and I'm going to pick the generic Ender 3 and we're going to say this is the Mac with Tech Custom Printer and click Add. Now here's where you have to be careful. You do need to make sure that the size of your machine, the setting, see that pop-up box there? We're going to talk about that in a few moments because that's not standard in Cura. I'm going to teach you how to add that. You do need to make sure that the settings that you're seeing here on the screen are correct. Your width, your depth, and your height. You need to make sure you're using the right style print bed. So if you're on a Delta printer with a round print bed, don't use an Ender as your starting printer. Use another Delta printer. It's very important to get this checkbox for heated bed correct. And then I'm going to click on Next. Now, there are a couple things you have to check to finish this up. The first is, does your printer have an auto bed leveling system? And the second is, is it a direct extruder or a Bowden tube Base system. A Bowden tube system is where the extruder is off on the side, it pushes the filament through a tube to the hot end. In a direct extruder, the stepper driver motor that pushes the filament into the hot end is right on top. That's going to require you change the retraction setting. So let's see how you make these two changes. I'm going to click on this arrow here, I'm going to click on Manage Printers, make sure my printer is selected, click on Machine Settings. Then I'm going to go into the G code right here and right after this G28, I'm going to add a G29. What did, how did I know that magic code? What is a G29? Well, these are all G code commands. The first command says we're going to start with everything set to zero. That's G92. Then we're going to move our print head to the home position. That's G28. 
Then the next couple commands, the G1 commands, will draw priming lines for your filament. But before we do that, we want to make sure we've enabled auto bed leveling. Now there are a number of ways to do this. I'm using the sort of surefire way, but it'll take a little more time. The G29 command is going to tell your printer to resense the print bed. Go through its auto bed leveling sequence. So I'm going to add that there and click on close and then close this. Now, if you're unsure of any of those commands, how do you find them? Well, it's really very easy. You just go into your favorite browser. It doesn't matter which one. And right in the search box you get on your browser, you type in G code, G29, hit an enter. And you're gonna get information about that G code command right up on the screen. And if you go down here to the entry listed as Marlin firmware, you're gonna get the detailed documentation about that command. So every command you see in that startup code is listed in here and you can just read about them. Okay, so we've adjusted the Make With Tech printer for an auto bed leveling system. Now, what about retraction? Now, retraction is the capability in a printer where when you're going to move the printhead from one spot to the other and not draw a line of filament, you don't want the printhead to be dripping, oozing filament. So you tell the printer to pull the filament back a little bit. Now, the filament that's melted in the hot end, that's not gonna pull back, it's melted. But it's gonna relieve the pressure so it won't ooze as much, which is what causes stringing. So how do we adjust that? Well, we're gonna to go to our profile here, but to be sure that you're gonna see everything, go over here to this hamburger menu and click on all. If you're on basic, you won't see all the settings I'm talking about. So we're gonna to go to all. We're gonna go down to the section that says travel and we're gonna change the retraction distance from five down to two. Because two is a good starting point for most systems that have direct extrusion. Then we can come up here and we can create a new profile from our settings. We're gonna call this the Make With Tech ABL plus retraction settings. Now the start code that we modified is not stored in these settings. It's stored in a different place but that just gave me an idea of what I'd done to this printer. Now we're ready to load a model, slice it and print. Wasn't that easy? So if you need to create a new printer, an easy way is start with a printer that's somewhat similar to your existing printer. Make sure the print bed's the right size. Make sure that you've adjusted for auto bed leveling and for retraction if you have a direct extruder. One other thing I want to show you very quickly, there is a capability here where you can add a custom printer and that'll work fine too. And, but when you do that, I need to warn you about one thing that won't often be right. So we're going to go to manage printers on that custom printer. We're going to go to machine settings. We're going to switch over to extruder. You'll notice the extruder material diameter is set to 2.85. Why? The Ultimaker printers, which are really more industrial um, and potentially print at higher speeds, use a thicker filament. So if you leave this set to this, your prints are gonna be all under extruded because most of the consumer grade printers are 1.75, not 175, 1.75. So if you use the custom option, or in general, you should check the material diameter size. Great, we are all done here. Now, let's look at the next tip secret hint about Cura. Often you wanna print something where the characteristics of the print are different from top to bottom. I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now I've switched to the FL Sun Super Racer profile on Incura, that's another printer I've reviewed. It's the fastest printer I've ever reviewed. So if you're looking for raw speed in a large format printer, it's a great, great printer to look at. 
So I'm going to load a model here for a sink strainer. Now, if we look at this model here, we'll see that the characteristics are interesting. There's this one point right here where the knob attaches to the strainer. That's got to be pretty strong. And in fact, the strainer on the bottom, you want to be relatively strong, but you don't really care about this lip all the way around, and you don't care about this knob on the top. So maybe we want the fill of this area on the bottom to be thicker, the infill, than on the top. How do you do that? Now, this is a bit of a contrived example, but you can think of other examples. Maybe you're 3D printing a horse and you want the legs to be stronger and the body to be hollow because it'll weigh less and uh, it'll print faster because the less infill you use, the faster it prints. So the technique I'm going to show you, and that's important about this video, we're talking about techniques, not so much how to point and click. The technique I'm going to show you will work in any case where you want to vary the characteristics of your slicer depending on where you are in the print. So I'm going to select this print here. And the first thing I'm going to do is slice it. Uh, just to show you in general what this would look like. So we're going to go to preview here. And we're going to zoom in. And if we look at this here, you'll see this X pattern on the screen. Well, that's because we have, I don't know, 20, 30% infill, maybe 15%. That's not very full. There's a lot of space there. If we go past the top layer, the top of the slicer, you'll see there's an X pattern inside also. So we want that bottom section, since it's not very thick anyways, to be completely solid. So to do this, I'm going to click on my model, then I'm going to click once on support blocker, and then click on my model. What did that do? It created another object on my screen. So I'm going to take that object, click on it, and click on scale. And I'm going to make it about as wide and deep as this object. So let's make it 1000 by... Ah, see what happened? I had uniform scaling set. So we don't want to set uniform scaling because we want it to be a flat surface like this. So I have it 1,000 by 1,000 by 20. Now I'm going to take and select that object again, and I'm going to move it so it covers my object. Now I'm going to rotate around here to make it easier to make sure it's covering my object. And now I'm going to take and I'm going to move it down. And how far down do I want to move it? Well, I want to move it down so it just intersects with that post. So that layer right there is solid. But it's not covering the bottom. So let's go over here to scale again. And let's make this 40. Let's make it a little bigger. And we'll go back to move here. And we'll move it down just a little bit more. Let's see if we can get this so it's... That looks about right, like that. So we're going to do something to the overlapping areas. To do that, we click on our object, we go to Per Model Settings, and we say we want to modify them for the overlapped areas. And you'll see some settings come up, the wall thickness, the bottom thickness. We don't want any of those, so we're gonna select Select Settings, and we can scroll down here to infill density that will add it over there. I can select close. And now we see infill density and I'm gonna make the bottom of this 100%. Now we're gonna go ahead and slice this. So I'm gonna click on slice over here. I'm gonna click on preview. Let's go back to the top and rotate around. And you can see we still have our mesh in here. Let's get down to the bottom. And the very top was always solid because we have solid top and bottom layers. Let's get down to the middle. Look how dense that is. It's basically completely solid now. 
And the reason is that we modified the settings just for those bottom layers. But you'll notice here, they aren't modified for the top layers. So there are a range of settings, the majority of settings, temperature, wall thickness, infill that you can all vary for individual parts of your model. Okay, let's talk about the third secret feature I want to introduce you to. This third feature is a standard feature in Cura that people see every day, but maybe they don't use. So let's click on Marketplace over here, and you'll scroll down and you can see there are quite a few items here in the Marketplace. Let's look at what some of them are. Uh, some of them are, here's an integration between Cura and Creality's new cloud, 3D printing cloud. Here is an integration with FreeCAD, another computer-aided design program. Here are some integrations with specific printers. The FlashForge printers use a slightly different version of G-code. They put what's called a binary header on the front, so that makes them out of the ordinary. So here's support for that. There's a range of different plugins. If you want to use Cura with Octoprint, there's a plugin for that. I'm going to show you how to set up one of these plugins as an example. We're going to go to the settings guide. So to give you an idea of what this does, if I go over here to something like wall line count, you'll see I get some information about that over here. Remember that it's just basic information. So now I'm going to go to the marketplace. I'm going to click on settings guide and I'm going to install it. I'm going to agree to the terms and conditions. And now it tells me I have to quit Ultimaker. It's unfortunate because of how these are engineered. They're written in Python. They're loaded when you start the program. You have to restart your program to load them. So I'm going to restart Cura here. So now I'm going to click on a setting here. And you'll see now that in addition to just that basic information, you have a full tutorial over here on the left-hand side about that feature, including beautiful pictures. So this is one of the most valuable plugins I found in the marketplace for me every day, because just by going through the features, one by one, you can learn about the inner workings of Cura. So the marketplace is a wonderful secret that's right out in the open. There's another secret that's right out in the open, and that is that if you go to extensions and click on post-processing, go to modify G-code, and you see here an option to add a script. All of these scripts allow you to do additional things that impact your print. So as an example, I could display the progress on the LCD screen on my printer. I can put the time remaining and the percent remaining right on my printer. And you can see here it actually shows you what command it's going to use in order to send that. So that's very useful, but sometimes the built-in scripts aren't what I'm looking for. So if I go back here to modify G-code, I see there's a script to make a filament change. Let's say I want to print the bottom of my print in white and the top of my print in orange. Well, it's easy to do that. You just stop the printer at the right place. You can do it from the front panel, but you want to do it very precisely. So let's send a, insert a command in our G-code to do that. So we select filament change, and it says here it uses the M600 command. Well, maybe my printer doesn't support that command. Earlier versions of Marlin didn't. If you're running on Marlin 2.0, you probably do. But there are other ways to pause a printer. So I'm going to delete that one. I'm actually going to delete this one. And I'm going to go over here to Help and click on Show Configuration Files. Now we're looking inside where Cura saves its information. This works the same on a Mac and a PC. And you'll notice there, there's a directory called Scripts. Any script designed for Cura I put in there will show up as a post-processing script. 
you can see I've added a script called change at height py. Literally, I downloaded it to my computer and I dragged it in there. How did I find that? Well, that happens to be on Thingiverse. We'll see this wonderful plugin. And so I downloaded this file and I dragged it into that directory. And that added a new capability to post-processing under modified G-code, because now I have a script called change filament at height. And you'll notice here that it gives me a number of different ways to pause my printer, depending on the printer I'm using. So there's the marketplace for general plugins that work inside of Cura, and then there are post-processing scripts that literally, they run after Cura has generated all your G-code to enhance your G-code for you. So that's another wonderful feature many people may not know about. What's next? Let's say you've completed a print and it completed successfully. Maybe you printed a vase, but there are like bumps on it in random places. What causes those bumps? Well, while it is possible to direct a 3D printer to print an actual curve, and in fact, current versions of Marlin support that, most slicers don't use that capability. Cura in the current version doesn't. Cura in the next version has a new slicing engine that'll come out with Cura version five that'll do a lot of magic. But in the current version, if you wanna draw a circle in Cura, it draws it by drawing many line segments. The smaller the segments, the better the round of the circle. So anytime Cura wants to create a curve, it does it with line segments. Here's a problem. The problem is that each time your printer changes direction, it slows down a little bit, changes direction, speeds up, slows down, and each of those intersections can cause a blob, an artifact in your printer. So to eliminate those blobs, you want to have less segments. So you have control over how big those segments are in Cura. Let's look at that. We're going to go to printer settings and we've gone over here to our hamburger menu and we're on all so we can see all of the settings. And we're going to go all the way down here to mesh fixes. And we're gonna look at this item called maximum resolution. Now, because I have the enhanced help enabled through the marketplace, we can see right on the screen here what that does. You'll notice this circle is a bit less round than this circle. That's because the maximum resolution is set to a larger number. So this is the largest size line it can use when drawing a curve. If you make this larger, your printer will have to slow down and speed up less often, and your prints will actually have less blobs. Now, if you set the maximum re resolution too high, your curves aren't gonna be very round anymore, but you can adjust for that. There's the ideal roundness, and there's the roundness you get from using these flat surfaces. You can measure the distance from that ideal roundness to the actual roundness, and that's shown right here. That's what maximum deviation is. If the maximum deviation is going to be over this number, it will use more segments. So by adjusting these two numbers, you can often eliminate blobbing on your print without any visual difference in what we can see with the human eye. Next, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Now, this next feature works almost correctly on a Mac, but one of the particular capabilities is disabled for some reason when you use it on a Mac, at least in the current version of Cura. So I'm gonna switch, you're gonna see the screen change a little bit. I'm gonna switch to a PC, actually a Windows Surface Go for this next segment. Now, while Cura is starting up, I wanna point out that the Surface Go is a very low-end Windows machine. I love it because it's so portable. It's a little tiny machine. You can take the keyboard off and use it as a tablet. So I use it as my travel computer, but it's not very fast. We're gonna try to do something 
a little different. I'm going to load an image, a JPEG, into Cura. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to click on Files, and I have this picture of my folks that I have enhanced a bit. I've made the background very dark. This was taken in the 1950s. I'm going to open that up, and I get this Convert Image box. Okay, height, base, width, depth, what is this? Well, this is going to create a lithophane. A lithophane is an image made originally in the early 16th, 17th, 1800s. They were made in porcelain. And it was a process where you would put a light behind a sheet of porcelain or a, perhaps a porcelain lamp cover, and you varied the thickness of the porcelain. Where the th porcelain was very thick, no light would shine through. Where the porcelain was very thin, a lot of light would shine through. And by doing that, by varying that thickness, you could create an image. It looks like a black and white or a sepia print. So we're gonna say the overall size of this image is 2.5 millimeters of this print we're going to make. The depth is 2.5. We're going to say darker is higher. That makes sense. So we want it to be thicker to be darker. And we're going to set it as translucent. That says create the infill in such a way that a little bit of light gets through everywhere. So it looks lit up. And then there's an option here for smoothing. We're going to leave that alone. And I'm going to click on OK. And let's watch what happens. This is magical. Now, you'll see here we got some model errors. What's that caused by? Well, if you select the translucent or the option and your base isn't thick enough, in order to make it translucent, you're going to end up with holes in your model. That's going to make it an improper 3D model. So let's go back and do this one more time. Select it again. And this time I'm going to say the base, instead of being 0.4 millimeters, that means the thinnest part, I'll set the thinnest part to 1.0 millimeters. Click OK. Now if we scroll this up, we can see here a bit of an image. It doesn't look great though. And if we look at it from the side, let's actually shift this up, we can see it sort of looks like a mountain range because you can see here how it's creating thin areas. This is a thin area. And it's creating very thick areas where it's going to be darker. Now, to print this properly, we want the printer to have lots of control over the thin areas and the high areas or thick areas. If we print it laying flat like this, what's the minimum difference between the individual parts? It's layer height, because our printer is going to move up at layers. So I printed a 0.2 millimeter layer height. It's going to go 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. I want more resolution. I want it to be able to move it at maybe a tenth of that. So what I need to do is I'm going to rotate this image around so that the layer height is being caused by the either the Y or the X axis where our printer has a lot of control. Now, in my case, I'm actually going to rotate so this is on the bottom down here because it's a more solid piece. So I'm going to click on my object. I'm going to click on rotate. But before I rotate, I'm going to twist this around because for some reason, Cura does a better job of rotating when you do it sideways. I'm going to rotate it to 90 degrees. And if we zoom back out here, we can see I now have my folks upside down on this print surface. Now there are a couple other things I have to set for this to print properly. I have to go over here, and I've already set these so they'll be set in here already. You want to verify your layer height. I found 0.2 works fine. You want to set infill to 100%. So let's set that to 100%. And on the build plate, you want to use a brim. Now, a brim is an area printed around your print, a flat surface. I'll show you that when I slice that. And we want the brim to be a little bigger. The default here for a brim, 
depending on your printer, uh, might be five or 10 lines of brim being printed. I'm gonna print 20. So I have a nice firm area holding this in place. Let's go ahead and slice this. And let's look at a preview. This print will take four hours to print. And if we look at this now, we can see the brim down here on the bottom, holding this in place. And if we go to the side, we can see that the thickness of this print does vary depending on where it's being printed. Now, that doesn't look very impressive on the screen. Let's go ahead and look at an actual lithophane and I'll show you how to make it come to life. The lithophane I showed you on the screen was 120 millimeters. This was 60, just so I could print it a little faster. And looking at it like this, probably doesn't look like anything. But I'm gonna actually um, do two things very quickly. I'm going to first, I'm gonna put a light behind it. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this well because um, we're in a lit studio. So I'm gonna get some help. Alexa, turn off the studio lights. Okay. And now you can see the lithophane. And I'll show you a close up of this so it looks, it's even easier to see. Alexa, turn on the studio lights. Well, folks, I hope you learned something today, but more important than learning how to enter parameters into Cura, I hope you learned some concepts about G-code and Marlin, how all printers are basically the same, about how circles are made up of straight lines and how you can use Cura to create images, beautiful prints that you can use as a gift. And the little purple box was actually 3D printed. I went into Tinkercad, designed it and 3D printed it and bought a little LED lamp off of Amazon for a few bucks. So if you did learn something today, please subscribe to the channel click on the bell so you'll be notified. And you can always discuss this video and others at forum.makewithtech.com. Thanks so much, have a great day, and let's continue to learn together.